I hope you're well refreshed for our next talk from Dr. Alex Moyler, who's a Bristol CDT graduate and now works for River Lane. Uh, River Lane are building an ultra low lo latency quantum operating system. So, Alex, if you're there. Hiya. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. Okay. Straight over to you. Okay. So, can you see my slide there? Yeah. Perfect. So, Thank you, Elliot, for that wonderful introduction, and thank you to the organizers as a whole for inviting me to this. I chaired a Q&A panel at the last Careers in Quantum event and really enjoyed it, and I'm very glad to have the opportunity to contribute again. So the first question you're probably wondering is, well, who am I? And there are many ways that I can answer this question. I like to think of myself as a science communicator. I did a lot of public engagement and, and outreach work in my PhD. And while I do less of that nowadays, I still like to have some involvement in that at part, as hobby. I also consider myself a musician. I've played the bass guitar for about 10 years now and the ukulele for um, about eight years. I play a lot of video games, especially during the whole of everything that's happened in 2020 and the last year. Um, I'm especially a fan of kind of platforming games and puzzle platforming games such as Celeste and Super Meat Boy. I literally just yesterday finished hiking a national trail and this is me at the end of the Ridgeway, one of the oldest tracks, one of the oldest roads in the United Kingdom. And finally, I'm a quantum scientist at River Lane, a Cambridge-based comp company working on software for near-term quantum computers. So the next question you may ask, this is my dog by the way. So the next question you may ask yourself is, well, how did I get here? So it's quite a long story, but I'm only going to point out the key details along the way. So if we start in 1993, I was born in South London and I'm going to skip over the next couple of years because people always do stuff as a kid that they never want to talk about. But the, the one detail that I will highlight is around about 2002 when I got my first video game console. It wasn't a great video game console, especially by today's standards. It was a secondhand PlayStation 1 that my mum got from a colleague she used to work with. And so, you know, didn't have the most impressive games on it, but I fell in love with it and got really into the hobby. And that was not the only thing that contributed to my interest in computers as a whole. I also grew up with both of my parents working in the computing industry, but it was a major contribution to like my interest in computers and my interest in how they work and how to program them. And this was that interest that spurred me to then study computer science at the University of Bristol for my undergraduate. Now, as it turns out, choosing to start a degree based on your love of video games isn't necessarily the best decision in, the, isn't in life. It turns out that actually making, while I enjoy playing them, I was not a fan of making video games, but, it was through this degree that I realized what I was interested in was the theory of computer science. This idea of what problems can or cannot be solved by a computer and how easily can those problems be solved. And it was this idea that first got me interested in quantum computing as well, as this idea of a machine which uses the powers of quantum physics to solve problems fundamentally faster than our best computers today. And that was how I first got interested in this. And I knew towards the end of my undergraduate that I wanted to do a PhD. And I found out that Bristol was offering a pro program for quantum technologies. So I applied for the Quantum Engineering Center for Doctoral Training at the University of Bristol and was offered a PhD there. Now it turns out, the last time I'd done physics was in about 2010 at A-level, and going from having not studied physics in four years to a postgraduate degree in physics is quite a big jump, but that was part of what I 
enjoyed so much about the Centre for Doctoral Training model is that you had a cohort of people who you could work together with. And these people came from all different backgrounds, including physicists who were able to help me get up to speed with the physics side of things. And in return, as a computer scientist, I was able to make my own contributions on the more kind of computer science related aspects of quantum technologies. And so I spent four or five years doing my PhD. And as I got to the end, I was thinking, what do I want to do next? X, do I want to stay in academia? Do I want to move to industry? Do I want to go back to software engineering? And I looked at all these different options. And in the end, I settled for working as a quantum scientist at Riverlane, as it felt like a nice balance of all of those options and, and a nice way of combining all of the skills that I'd learned over the past um, nine years or so. And so I started working at Riverlane in 2020. It's worth noting, because of 2020 that I haven't actually moved to Cambridge yet. I'm currently working remotely from Wiltshire, but I'm hoping to move over the set. I'm uh, assuming there isn't another rise from the Delta variant or anything else. So let's talk a bit more about that last point. Who are we at Riverlane? It's first worth noting this is quite an old photo now. The company has expanded quite a bit since this photo. Also was already taken, again, because of um, the pandemic that we've had over the last year. But broadly speaking, we are a company based in central Cambridge, just across the road from Emmanuel College, if you know the area. And we are a mixture of people from all sorts of different backgrounds, including science, computer science, mathematics, electronic engineering, as well as people from product development backgrounds and business management and business development backgrounds, all united, uh, all united around our one mission of developing software that powers the world's quantum computers. And we want to develop software which is particularly beneficial for all parties involved in quantum computers. So we want to help out the kind of end users of quantum computers, people like pharmaceutical companies who want to understand how a quantum computer can benefit their business. But we also want to help out the hardware manufacturers, the people who are actually trying to build these computers. How can we make their jobs easier as well? So I'll talk now a bit about the two teams that I have worked on in particular in my time at Riverlane. So the first team is the science team, where we ask ourselves the question, how long will it take for a quantum computer to solve a particular problem? And so we might have a customer such as Aztec Pharmaceuticals, who work in the pharmaceuticals industry. They'll come along with a computational chemistry problem that they need to solve and their particular requirements for it. And from this, our role is to figure out, okay, first of all, what is the most suitable algorithm for it? running this and how much will it cost to run. From that, we then need to figure out, okay, well, that, that's great in our ideal setting, but errors might accumulate either due to noise in our quantum computer or just because our algorithm isn't perfect, it will be some approximation to the, to the actual solution. So how do we correct for those and handle both of those types of errors? And finally, we look at, okay, so once we've managed to run our corrected algorithm, how do we get our final result out from that? And from this, we're able to determine a full costing of how expensive it will be to run a quantum computer for this particular problem, and therefore uh, um, consult with Aztecs on how beneficial the quantum computer would be for them. The other team I have worked on in my time at Riverlane is the engineering team. So this is um, what Elliot hinted at earlier about low-level programming of quantum computers. So what we ha have here is um, a brief slide about our 
about delta flow, our quantum operating system. So the idea of delta flow is that rather than having this black box model of a quantum computer, where you feed it, where you give it a quantum circuit and it spits out some results, and you have no idea what happens within the qu quantum computer, you just know that you gave it a circuit and it gave you back some results. The reality is that a quantum computer has many different layers to it. So it will have the main CPU, which is what you're actually interacting with if at the highest level. And then below that, there'll be a couple of FPGAs, which are faster devices, lie closer to the qubits. These will then drive the analog control devices, which are our qubit IO. And these in return, these in turn will be what actually manipulates and controls your physical qubits at the bottom here. And so what Delzaflow asks is, can we get gain more power from our quantum computer by granting more access to these lower layers, these intermediate layers such as the FPGAs? Can, if we have lower level control of them, can we get more value from a quantum computer? And so we've been working on developing this with these hardware companies along the bottom here who work across all of the different quantum platforms, including photonics, silicon, superconducting circuits, and trapped ions. And we're also, now that Delta Airflow has been kind of established as a language, we're now working on developing particular low-level applications for it, um, look, such as self-calibration. So how do you correct for your cute qubits when they naturally drift over time? And also error correction. So how can we get from our collection of noisy physical qubits to a smaller number of error corrected logical qubits. So if you want to learn a bit more about, about what we do or what we, we get up to, there are a few options you can do. You can speak with us later today. So Ophelia, uh, my colleague, and I will be at the networking session this afternoon. You can also have a look at our white paper the practical quantum computing, the value of local computation. This is where we kind of outline the idea of that delta flow, why we think it's valuable and what, what benefits that having lower level at control over your quantum computer can offer you. And if you're really curious, you can try out delta flow for yourself. So the program, the language that for delta flow is completely open source. It's written in Python. You can have a look, look at our documentation there, as well as get tape, as well as explore our various examples and tutorials of the programs that we've written in the lab language, as well as trying to write some applications of your own. Finally, um, I would just like to say that we are actively looking for people with rapidly growing ourselves as a company. So if you are about to graduate or have, rec or have recently graduated, we have a number of openings across both the science and engineering teams. You can find out more at this link here. We, if you are a current student, we also offer internships. So we have a summer internship open to undergraduates and postgraduates, as well as Intern a collection of internships specifically for PhD students, which run throughout the year. Uh, we have currently closed our internship scheme for this year, but uh, we will next open it in January 2022. So keep an eye on our website for then. And if you want some more general advice on how to apply or what it is like working in the team, you can check out some of our new stories on our website here. And we're We'll share various tips and opinions on what it's like, not just for us, but also working within the quantum industry as a whole. And finally, I would like to emphasize that you don't need, it's nice to have 
quantum information experience, but you don't need to have it. Uh, if you don't have quantum information experience, don't worry about it. But feel free to apply anyway. We will train people up if they do, don't have that experience. And we, we were uh, more keen to find a broad range of discipline, people from a broad range of disciplines who are willing to apply their skills with it and interested in seeing what it's like in this industry. So that's all I have to say. If you want to get in touch, you can find my email address here, as well as look, look at some more information on our website or interact with us on social media. We're on Twitter at Rivalane.io. And thank you very much. And I'm happy to take questions. Thanks a lot, Alex. That's a great talk. Um... You're bang on time, so we've got plenty of time for a proper conversation now. Um, so, I mean, my first question is kind of one that is quite a recurring theme um, in this event is, what would you look for in a, in a graduate or an applicant? Um, you, you've already said it's, it's like, they don't have to be a kind of PhD graduate. Mm. So what would set someone apart from people who imagine kind of finish a CDT course and are ready for PhD versus like, you know, if you're an undergrad, how would you? So obviously industry, industry experience can help with this as well as kind of as much programming experience as possible is always a benefit. Oh, it, we benefit. Um, so like I said, we work, so we work primarily in Python. So a lot Python and C, uh, as well as other languages such as C, but generally just more experience in programming languages, the better. We also have a lot of kind of, um, use a lot of kind of tools for kind of automating our systems. So experience with like best experience of software engineering, best practice practices and automation is a nice bit benefits as well. And general some generally just some kind of amount of interest in research. Some amount of interest in research as well. Not necessarily like having contributed, but at least an interest and a willingness to explore, I think. Cool. Okay. Uh, there's there's a couple of questions that are kind of related. Uh, mm -hmm to each other and to this. So um, the, the first one is to say, saying, when you say that like, no, no quantum experience is needed uh, and that we will train you, um, they're asking if this is something similar to CDTs or is it kind of more on the job training? It's on the job training. So, so yeah, we'll have, we have resources, but it won't be like a proper seminar postgraduate degree. Okay, and the, the kind of the follow-up to that is, um, if it's a PhD student who's kind of coming to do an internship, for example, uh, do you have a project, that, like an example project that they might work on? So yeah, we put out advertisements for, for the PhD scheme, we put out advertisements for specific projects. Okay. So for instance, currently we have um, one intern who has just started with us working on um, using um, machine learning learning units, so things like like intelligent using AI chipsets um, for quantum computing, and seeing how they can benefit us. Yes. And that was a project where we put out an explicit description of what we want, what we're thinking of doing of this project, and interns, PhD students applied for that specific project. There's a, there's a couple of quick ones, and I've, I've mm -hmm. asked both of them because we're, we're tight on time, but I suspect there'll be quick answers. Uh, first is, how many internships does Rivalent offer each year? Um, we offer six PhD students and six summer internships. Okay, so, uh, and another one, a quick follow-up is, um, does that mean that your kind of, you've, your uh, hiring round is kind of finished for this year? For internships, yes. For Hiring as a whole, no, we're definitely, um, we closed our net second round of funding earlier this year, so we've, we're looking to expand quite rapidly. Awesome. Well, 
best of luck. Thank you. <laughs> it's really well. Um, I mean, thanks for that talk. I, it's, we've just hit time now. So uh, there's, there's a few questions in the Q&A. Uh, we'll, we'll pop them in the Slack if you can have a look at after. Thank you. I'll make sure to do so. Thanks. Well, have a great day. Thanks for that. Thank you.